This text is both a warning and an exhortation uh, wrapped up in the, same, in the same breath. The exhortation, of course, is to go on unto perfection. Let us go on to perfection. You can't, you can't stay young forever. You can't stay immature uh, in, in the faith. There, is, there really is no coast in the faith. Not the spirit, spiritual realms don't, don't work like that. You, in the, in the uh, things of the world, you can, you can learn uh, so much up to, up to a certain point in any one subject and kind of just stay there, if that, uh, maintain that level, if that suits your interest suits, and suits your purpose. But it, that doesn't suit anyone in, in the kingdom. There's only two methods. There's forward and backward. In the, in the kingdom. So the exhortation, of course, is to go forward, to go on to perfection, to go on to maturity, to grow up in the Lord. And, of course, the warning is wrapped up in that, is that if you don't, then you have incurred a tremendous liability. Because backsliding is the only other option. Drawing back. And uh, the, de the destination of drawing back is perdition. It's a phrase used uh, in this letter to the Hebrews. The, th this is very consistent with the whole, the whole, the tone of this whole letter to the Hebrews. There's constant warning given to them. It says, "Let us not, um, let us give heed, more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Let us consider the apostle and high priest of our profession." Let's. Um, there's just co th these constant words of exhortation that are that are wrapped wrapped up and intertwined with these words of warning. The exhortation is like the exhortations are being driven by the danger that is that's facing the Hebrews because they're as you uh, as they have uh, lingered, they've lagged behind and not been pressing forward. Then they 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 incur more and more. Liability. The slow, the slower the pace that you maintain in the spirit, the more and more liabilities that you have. Yeah. Yeah. The the faster there's a, a phrase that one of the ancient prophets used of running with the swift, and as you, the fat, it's like the faster you run, the less enemies you have. <laughs> you're, you, you're always going to have enemies, but you can you can eliminate. You can just reduce a lot of your enemies by 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 running fast by running by keeping it keeping a quick pace and uh, and then you you just you just miss a lot of a lot of the attacks that the enemy has um, uh, has to use against you now if if it becomes necessary Paul will lay again the foundation of these six things that he mentions but it's much it's a much more excellent way to go on so that they don't have to be laid again laying a foundation again is always more costly than the initial fr uh, stage of laying a foundation laying again the foundation is more difficult because it's it's it involves unlearning and relearning Remember, Peter said it would have, it would have been better if they had never known the way of righteousness. We could say it this way: it would be better to have learned nothing about faith than to think that faith is is your own creation in your own mind. And that is actually the approach some people have of faith: is this uh, uh, this is kind of the faith that I've found, and this is this is my faith. You can have your faith. It's better to not learn to not hear anything about faith than to than to have a bad foundation about faith. Amen. <clears throat> An eroding foundation is harder to fix than just laying a foundation to begin with. Yeah. The Galatians are an example of this. The Holy Spirit writing to them, he said, "Who who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth?" Having begun in the Spirit, do you now think that you're made perfect by the flesh? That how, how did you come to this conclusion? You knew, it was clear to you, that you began in the Spirit. That this was not of man that wills or of man that runs, but of God that showeth mercy. And now somehow you think that you're going to be made perfect by the flesh? You see how that's, that condition is so much more complicated than just pure, unadulterated infancy. 
the Laodiceans are also an example of this eroding foundation. Is that it would it would be it would be better to know nothing about Christ, but yet still to know that you're a sinner, than to com- than to think that you're have that you have need of nothing and that you're increased with goods. Yeah. It would be better that you had no foundation of Christ at all than to have this this faulty, eroding, tilted mm-hmm. foundation. Yeah. To think that you're doing well when Christ is actually on the outside knocking on the door. These are the kinds of people that have a bad foundation or an eroding foundation that Peter was writing about in his second letter, 2 Peter 2.14, when he talked about unstable souls that were beguiled. Beguiling unstable souls. Well, of course, you don't think that the, uh, the wicked one doesn't have some... Uh, some way to assess the the condition of of people in the world, and of course he goes for easy targets. Every enemy does this. So an unstable soul is somebody that he can take with minimal effort, yeah. and an unstable soul is the soul who has an eroding foundation or no foundation at all. So let's go on unto perfection, not laying again this foundation. Uh, he mentions six things in this uh, list of foundation. And these can actually be viewed in, in like three different, three pairs, three pairs of two. The first two of repentance and faith. Those are initial, n- initial things that are given to us. Repentance and faith. And the second pair is baptism and laying on of hands. Those are both outward things that we do, but actually God's doing the real work in them, not us. And the final two are, are things that will happen in the end, resurrection and judgment. Those are final at the, end, at the end of the race, and they're also global. Everyone will be resurrected, and everybody will be judged. So it's like three pairs of things, and David did that a lot in the Psalms. He would say the same thing in two different ways. And so this is kind of like uh, um, a common, you know, among, among the Hebrews, among the Jewish people, to put pairs of things together. <clears throat> repentance and faith. They're both first works. They're both beginning works. Yeah. And they're both given to us. Faith comes right. and repentance is granted. Yeah. Right. They're beginning. See, he's, he's talking about foundational things. Mm-hmm. He's not saying that you've had, um, you, don't forget these advanced things that, that, you, that you've learned. He's saying you can't forget these foundational things that you've learned. Repentance and faith, they're foundational things. And that baptism and laying on of hands, they're, they're things that we do. We lay hands on each other and pray. Moses laid hands on Joshua and prayed. But Moses didn't set Joshua apart. God did. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So God's doing the, doing the real work. So these are first principles. They're foundational. They are the foundation on which the rest of the building is built. They're principles. In other words, the, the building can't proceed without these things in place. And if, if the building has proceeded and there's already somewhat of a skeleton up, that there, the structure's already been started and there's walls and there's, the, there's a roof and there's some doors and there's some windows in this structure, and then the foundation starts to erode, well, you can see as the foundation shifts, well, then it puts everything at jeopardy. Amen. Everything's in peril because the foundation, the foundation can't move. If the foundation is shifting, then the rest of the building is... Uh, is is obviously going to suffer. To make this uh, to make this very personal and applicable is if your if your idea of faith has been infiltrated, then everything everything else that God could give you, could teach you, could show you, could bring to you, it's all gonna it's all hindered. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because of because found because faith is at at the at the foundation. If you have this idea of judgment wrong, eternal judgment, well, then everything else is going to be wrong too. Uh-huh. Because judgment, the truth, the, the reality of judgment is at the, it's a principle. It's a foundation. Yeah. And if that's wrong, then it's going, it's like the cornerstone. Yeah. 
But Jesus, uh, Peter used that, that phrase about Jesus being the cornerstone or the found, the head of the corner where it's laid first and it determines the, the size and the, and the scope of the whole work. And if it's tilted, then everything else is going to be, is going to be out, of, out of square. Now let's look at these things uh, individually. Repentance. And remember, keep in mind that these are foundational things. These are not advanced things. These are foundational things. These are the ABCs. These are the elementary things that have to be in place. Repentance from dead works. Turning from and forsaking sin. The requirement of turning from turning away from sin. Forsaking self and the world. There's old, um, the old, uh, I don't know um, the, the, the dates necessarily, but it's kind of the old theology of uh, t- of of uh, repentance is from sin, self, and world. Those three categories. And John the Baptist came to prepare the way of the Lord. Here's how foundational repentance is. John the Baptist came, hit the hallmark of his message was repent. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't pre- now he, he answered some questions about you know the, what the soldiers should do in their job and he no doubt people ask him varying questions like that. They all kind of centered around repentance. And he, this was his, the mainstay of his message. Matthew 3, 2, he said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is the, what's the appropriate response to God moving among men? Repent. This is the foundational thing. How else, what's going to be the hallmark of this man that had the, had the Holy Spirit from the womb, from his mother's womb? What is going to characterize his message? What's going to characterize his ministry? What, what has to happen to prepare the way for the Lord? You see how foundational this is? got to be repentance. There's got to be repentance from sin. He can't start with something else. He can't start with hope. There's got to be repentance before there can be before hope can be, you know, can be put on the table. He's gotta, there's got to be repentance. If the definition of sin is wrong, then the human race isn't going anywhere. Not with regards to coming to God. Acts 2.38, the first thing that Jesus did when He ascended up on high and sat down at the right hand of God, the first thing that He did was manifested there when the Peter and the other apostles were speaking the wonderful works of God, and the first word of instruction that was given was repent. Yeah. Yeah. It's the first evidence of the exalted Christ. The first thing he has shed forth this which you see and hear. So what should we do? You should repent. That's how foundational it is. Acts 5. Chapter 5, verse 31, Peter says that Jesus was actually exalted to give repentance. Yes. Mm-hmm. So it's really not up to men whether they repent or not. Now, I understand that we're, our, our choice is, is, is required. Yeah. Man has to enter into the work of repentance, but it has to be given to him. Amen. Yeah. Esau uh, stands, stands as, as a leader uh, in this area, that he sought for repentance even with tears, and he couldn't find it. He fought, found no place for repentance. So, what should we learn by this? Is that you you should rejoice for mercy when you're given repentance, Amen. because God, everyone who's repented, was given mercy by God Amen. to repent. In fact, it was preached to the uh, in Acts chapter uh, 17. I think these, these were the philosophers that Paul was speaking to. And, he's, and he said that God commands all men everywhere to repent. That's right. This is like the first item on the table. If there's no repentance, God, the, the, the things just come to an end with regards to God working in man. That, this is the beginning stage as man repents. The edict went out. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the next, the next item then is man repentant. Conviction of sin. The, this, the, first, the first item on the agenda when the Holy Spirit comes to, 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 uh, to start wor- uh, working in an individual is conviction of sin. He come to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And repentance is the fruit of conviction. Yeah. Yeah. Romans 2 verse 4 says, he, or, Do you despise the riches of His goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Yeah. So repentance is actually a response to God being good to you. God, 
He shows His goodness. That can be manifested in mercy, in patience. How, who, who, which one of us could not, cannot look back in our lives and mark times and dates and places and actions where we can, we can identify the only reason we're still here after that is because God was good. Amen. He was patient with us. The patience of God means salvation. The goodness of God is what led us led us to repentance. Yeah. So it's like, it's like the door to salvation. On one side it says repentance, on the other side it says goodness. Yeah. When it swings, you see both things. Uh -huh. When the door opens, you see goodness and you see repentance mm -hmm. at the same time. In Acts chapter 11, when the apostles, when they saw that the Gentiles, they were offered, they were preached, they were accepted after Peter went down to Cornelius' house, and they, they concluded, then also hath God to the Gentiles granted repentance. Amen. This was very, very clear to them at the beginning Amen. that these Gentiles repented because God opened the door of repentance to them. Yeah. Not because the Gentiles, they, they did, it's not because they finally figured out the Jewish secret. It's because God granted repentance. Yeah. God gave them repentance. And this is, this is not something that we, get, that we grow accustomed to. You can look back in your life and you, you, you revisit the day you repented and you give, you give God thanks for the mercy He gave you. Because you never would have repented. Until to this day, you wouldn't have, none of us would have repented unless God granted us repentance. But God works, He works the same today as He did then. So we, should, we also should, uh, should rejoice and glorify God when He gives repentance. <clears throat> now repentance... Paul said to Timothy, is unto the acknowledging of the truth. So turning, uh, re repentance is turning from and turning to. It's a forsaking of one and an embracing of the other. For 2 Timothy 2.25, In meekness instructing those that, that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to uh -huh. the acknowledging of the truth. So the acknowledging of the truth or the embracing of the truth is what verifies that the repentance was real. That re verifies that this was genuine repentance. They're acknowledging the truth. That's, a, that's, what, that's what verifies the, uh, the repentance. Now with each of these six things, I want to conclude the, each six points with, this, this, uh, with a note of contrast. He's saying, let's not lay again this foundation. Let's go on to perfection. We don't want to have to lay this again because if these things, if the foundation of repentance from dead works is taken away, if it is, then, ma then sin will be master over you. That's right. If the foundation of repentance is taken away, sin will be your master. That's what will happen. I have an idea that the he some of the things that the Holy Spirit write, wrote to the Hebrews in this letter, they probably didn't didn't see them as such an eminent danger. Uh -huh. But it's because the, the, Paul was so sensitive in his spirit to the ways of the Lord and the ways of, of the world yeah. that he could see. Yeah. He could yeah. see the, the, the direction things were going. Yeah. Repentance and faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. There's a, there's a lot of other ideas about what faith is in the, um, in the religious world today. Faith comes by hearing. That means God gives faith. The same, and I, I believe their their uh, their package faith is packaged very closely together with repentance. Yeah. When repentance comes, it's like there's 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 some faith with the repentance. Faith is otherwise. What? Why would you repent unless you are convicted and you are convinced of something that you didn't see before? There wouldn't. There would be no motivation to repent of sin unless faith had convinced you of things not seen. Yeah. Unless you had some assurance of a judgment that, do that doesn't appear yet. See, of faith and repentance, they travel, it's like they travel close together. <clears throat> there, there are different measures of faith. Matthew 8, 26, Jesus said, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Yeah. So faith, faith, can be, faith can be small, be hard to see, hard to detect. It can be oh, it can be wa washed over little, like the washed over easily, like the the waves did on that boat. Oh, ye of little faith! Yeah. 
He said to the blind men in Matthew 9, 29, he touched their eyes, according to your faith, be it done unto you. And maybe, maybe some of those men, I don't, we don't know because it doesn't say, but maybe some of them didn't see as well as the other ones did after that healing. Remember Jesus healed the one blind man after he took him out of the city. He said, what do you see? He said, I see men as trees walking. Yeah. Well, maybe some of the, uh, but see, according to your faith, yeah. be it done unto you. Yeah. There's different measures of faith. Jesus stretched out his hand to Peter and took and pulled him up out of the water and said, O oh, thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Well, he had enough faith. He did walk on the water to Jesus. But then he got distracted. And Jesus uh, asked him, or he, he called, uh, said that he had, he had uh, little faith. Faith toward God. Now the just shall live by faith. That's how, that's how foundational faith is. Without faith in the picture, there's, no, there's not even a hint of acceptance of, of man before God. The just shall live by faith. His faith is counted for righteousness. It's said of Abraham, Romans chapter 4, all the way back in, in Genesis. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So being justified depends on faith. The imputation of righteousness depends on faith. That's how foundational faith is. Romans 4, 14, 23, He that doubts is damned if he eat. Well, if that's all, if that's all you knew, if, if he had just ended the verse there, well, it, it would it kind of leave you, leave you with some fear and intrepidation, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? He that doubts is damned if he eats. But he eat, because he eateth not of faith, now, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's a pretty good definition. That's a very, very inclusive definition. Whatever's not of faith, doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. It's sin. Mm -hmm. But you can also conclude from that that everything that is of faith <laughs> is accepted. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Well, that's why the just shall live by faith. Yeah. This is foundational. God has nothing to do with man except when it's, when it's through faith. Yeah. He gives nothing to man except He gives it to them through their faith. He receives nothing from man except He receives it through their faith. He does nothing in man. He doesn't lead. He doesn't teach. He doesn't talk. He doesn't bless. He doesn't anything except it through faith. Yeah, that's, right. that's why He uses this word walk yeah. because it's this all-encompassing we walk by faith, not by sight. <clears throat> in fact, the Holy Spirit summarizes all of salvation in this way. In Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all, it all comes, and it all goes. It, in, from our perspective, it all comes through faith. Uh -huh. From God's perspective, it all goes through faith. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So to conclude this point, if the foundation of faith is eroded from under a person, then they will have no, they will in no wise be convinced of things that are unseen. That's right. No foundation of being convinced that God is. No foundation to be convinced that He is reconciling the world uh, through Christ to Himself. Without faith, you won't, a person can't be assured, convinced, convicted, persuaded of anything that's unseen. They'll have no hope without faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. The substance of things yeah. hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Second one is baptisms, which is the form of the doctrine. <clears throat> Romans 6.17 says that you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, which of course encapsulates the, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. The Ethiopian eunuch whom... Uh, uh, Philip preached to in Acts chapter 8. See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? I have an idea. He probably wasn't told um, told that you need to be baptized. He was probably preaching the baptism of Jesus. Amen. Saul in Acts chapter 18. The, immediately the Pharaoh fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and rose and was baptized. There wasn't any debate about it. That's right. Cornelius, Acts chapter 10, Can any forbid water that these should not be baptized who receive the Holy Ghost, even as we? 
This is this is a this is how things start out. Is the form of the doctrine is baptism. Lydia in Acts chapter 15, and when she was baptized and her household, Acts chapter 16, uh, she besought us, if you've judged me faithful, come and, and uh, be uh, in our house. Act, again in Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer, he took, the, took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all of his house uh, straightway. What a change of roles in Acts chapter 16 there. He went from guarding the jail to being baptized by the one he was guarding. Amen. The things that are associated with baptism, it's no wonder the baptism been, has been attacked from all different angles. Forgiveness of sin is associated with baptism. The wa washing of the conscience, cleansing of the conscience is associated with baptism. It's called the operation of God. Yeah. Baptism. It's that God's doing the real work in baptism. We obey the disciples, they, they baptized, but God was the one doing it. It's called the operation of God. Yeah. The circumcision of Christ. Yeah. Well, a work that can't be seen. It can only be detected. It can be experienced, but not seen. That's associated with baptism. The gift of the Holy Spirit is associated with baptism. It's foundational. It has to do with our induction into the kingdom. Our entrance into the kingdom. Well, it's no wonder there's been so much, so many attacks against this, this foundational doctrine, all these benefits that come to us in, in baptism, it's been the, it's been the subject of, of a lot of, of, a lot of a, a attack. Mm -hmm. If baptism, if the foundation of baptism is taken away from a person, then the very definition, your very idea of salvation will change. Amen. What salvation, what is salvation? Laying on of hands. Laying on of hands is an outward sign of God's choice. God chose, they laid their hands on them and prayed. It's God's appointment. Through laying on of hands, it was, it was demonstrated that these have been appointed uh, to this work. It's also, a, it's also a mode of giving a gift. Remember Peter laid his hands on, on the, the believers of Samaria and prayed? And the gift of the Holy Spirit was, was given to them. It's also a sign of blessing, of bestowing blessing. Laying on of hands. And uh, Jesus laid, he touched the children. And they were, and that was a sign of, of, of blessing. In Numbers uh, chapter 27, the Lord said to Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. So when the congregation saw Moses laid hands on Joshua and prayed for him. Well, Joshua had obviously been appointed. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That was manifested through the, the, the outward act of laying on of hands. It was demonstrated that Joshua was chosen. There wasn't going to be a democratic voting process. God chose, God appointed, and God set Joshua yeah. over. Numbers chapter 8, Thou shalt bring the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall put their hands on the Levites. Yeah. So this is not a voluntary office. You can't just come like as a field trip and serve as a Levite for a week. doesn't work like that. God chose the Levites to do that work. You either born a Levite or you weren't a Levite. And if you were a Levite, you did this work in the tabernacle. You were a helper. You were a servant. And this is the work you did because God chose the Levites. It wasn't open and democratic. God appointed it. And God demonstrated it by the laying on of the hands. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 48 remember when Israel was old he stretched out his right hand upon the two sons of Joseph Manasseh and Ephraim and he crossed his hands because he knew the blessing was going to the younger not the older it was demonstrated in, his in the laying on of hands remember Joseph was troubled by it and Israel knew what he was doing there's another example the older shall serve the younger in Acts chapter 13, when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, Barnabas and Saul. Separate them for the ministry that I've given them to do. In Acts chapter uh, 6, they, they found seven, seven men that met this, these qualifications and they set them before the apostles. They prayed and they laid their hands on them. It's a common practice. <clears throat> well, if this foundation is eroded and destroyed 
this this uh, con this truth of laying on of hands, then the 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 will of man can actually be allowed to trump the will of God. Yeah. If this foundation is eroded, then people will actually think their choice is equal to or even maybe preeminent to the choice of God. Well, that sounds rather contemporary, doesn't it? Well, maybe we have all these, these, uh, these flighty ideas and doctrines about the free will of man because people never did learn this foundational truth of the laying on of hands. Well, the resurrection of the dead. The foundation of the resurrection <clears throat> has a profound impact on life in this world. Amen. Amen. In, in Christ, in Adam, all have died, and so in Christ shall all be made alive. So you don't just go around once, do you? Have you ever heard where that saying comes from? Yeah. Well, you only go around once. Oh, no, you don't. You go around, well, I guess it might be true, you go around once in this world. Yeah, yeah. And then you come back. Yeah. Because in Christ shall all be made alive. Yeah. Jesus, in Matthew 22, He ascribed the, the, this great error about, about the world to come and the resurrection. It says, you do err not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. Yeah. If you understood the resurrection, then you wouldn't have this this big question, these big issues about in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Oh, they thought it was a really tough issue to deal with. It really wasn't that tough if they understood the resurrection. In the resurrection, they aren't married or given in marriage. They, they will be as the angels of God in heaven. If you understood the resurrection, you would not have even asked the question. Yeah, that's right. There's a whole lot better questions to be asked than whose wife will she be? You could have, they could have asked a question that Jesus would have answered. He said, you do greatly err. You don't know that. In other words, Jesus did say wrong question. I know people say there is no wrong question. And from one, from one very charitable perspective, it's true. There is no wrong question. But there are questions that you want to avoid, aren't there? Because they minister strife. That's right. There are questions that just minister more questions. So that it is possible to ask the wrong question. Amen. <clears throat> Now Paul, when he was, was on trial, he said, I, I stand and am judged for the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And I think there were some people there today that said, what? He's not a prisoner because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. But he, uh, when Paul, he, Paul drilled down to the real issue, is that he ministered the way he did because of his hope of the resurrection of the dead. He labored the way he did because he had the hope of the resurrection of the dead. He, drew, he told them the real reason that he did the things he did and he said the things he said and he went the places he went. He wrote the things that he wrote. He told them the real reason is because of my hope of the resurrection of the dead. <clears throat> Martha was far beyond a lot of people today. She says, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection of the last day. <clears throat> and so this mode of life where people say, let us eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, they only say that because they have their, their foundation of, re of the resurrection of the dead is eroded. They have no foundation of the resurrection, so they just, we have to, we have to live it up while we're here. That approach to life Oh, is it, it only exists where people are not convinced of the resurrection. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. In fact, our, our preaching is vain, uh -huh. and your faith is also vain if there's no resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. That is the way, the way that you are living... Your whole mode of living by faith is utterly foolish, yeah. except that there's a resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Let's say it this way. The resurrection is going to validate and satisfy every, every motivation that faith moved you to live to God and not the world. The resurrection is going to validate it. Everything that you withdrew from and abstained from, and everything that you denied, everything that you threw off, everything that you, that you kept yourself from, everything that you suffered with conscience toward God, 
and didn't retaliate, it's going to be validated at the resurrection of the dead. Amen. You'll have an awful hard time suffering wrongfully unless you're convinced that you're going to be raised from the dead. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's right. David said, I'll be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Yeah. David, he didn't... He, there wasn't as much revealed to David as there has been to us about the resurrection, but he sensed that this life, I, it, it, it can't be that I just live and die like a dog. He knew, he knew enough about God that there was, there, was going to be, there was going to be a resurrection. In fact, Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 that all, all means are, are warranted in order to obtain the resurrection of the dead. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That is, if I attain to the resurrection of the dead, then that, that, that makes everything I went through worth it. Amen. <clears throat> In fact, this issue of the resurrection of the dead is so critical that if it, <clears throat> if it is taken away from people, it will overthrow their faith. Yeah. That's right. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.18 who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. You know, we live in such a unique day <clears throat> that people aren't even teaching that the resurrection is past. They're teaching, they're not even mentioning the word resurrection. Right. It's like, like there's a religious, religious generation that doesn't even have the word resurrection in their vocabulary. And we've heard things preached very close to here. He said things like, I, you know, I would rather preach on something else other than the resurrection. I remember hearing that. <clears throat> so if this does not, if this foundation of resurrection from the dead does not exist in people, then hope is destroyed. Yes. It's impossible to have hope without a knowledge of the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Amen. Lastly, <clears throat> Eternal judgment. The books are being written today. Just stop and think. There's a book being written yeah. by... Because of, because of the things that I'm standing before you saying, there's a, uh, there's a book being written right now. Uh -huh. There's a book being written. In fact, the judgment day will be so meticulous and so thorough. There's a book being written right now according to how you are listening to the things that I'm saying. That's how meticulous the book is. Judgment of the last day. To such a, to, to such a thorough degree that every word and every deed and every thought will be accounted for. And not just, not just dug up and shown to you, look what you did. No, we are going to do the digging up. We're going to do the confession. Every, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will confess. Without exception, without varying degree. Amen. I know there's a, there's a fairly common approach to this among Christian people that, that the saved won't be publicly judged. Yeah. This, is, this is disastrous. God's, God has declared every tongue will confess. Yeah. <clears throat> God will be justified in all of His sayings. Right. Amen. He has said, all have sinned. So guess what's going to happen at the Day of Judgment? All are going to confess yeah. that they have sinned, and God will be justified in all of His sayings. Yeah. Now here's where the Gospel comes into play. When I confess my sins, I can also confess that they were taken away. Yes, that's right. Amen. Eternal judgment. <clears throat> now, the, 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 the truth of eternal judgment also has a dramatic, profound impact on how life is lived in this world. Romans 14.10 But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Your knowledge of the day of judgment will profoundly impact how you deal with your brothers. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Hebrews 9.27 As it appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. A lot of appointments broke in this world, but this is an appointment that no one can break. You're appointed to die, 
and then to be judged. Even Solomon <clears throat> said, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Then shall every man have praise of God. Now the, the knowledge of the day of judgment is not just about fear. Yes. It's not just about uh, re 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 uh, restraining yourself from like taking somebody out because you're angry. The knowledge of the judgment can restrain as well, but the knowledge of the judgment can also compel. Yeah. The knowledge of the judgment is not just going to keep you from being a bad guy. The knowledge of the judgment is, is, draw, is drawing, is motivating, because then shall every man have praise of God. Amen. So the knowledge of the day of judgment is not just about everybody getting what's coming to them. The day of judgment is about, just think about God praising God praising a man. <clears throat> Felix, he trembled when Paul reasoned about righteousness and, and uh, temperance and judgment to come. He, he trembled, but in the, in the assembly of the righteous, when we reason about the judgment to come, well, I'm made accepted in the beloved. I don't tremble at the face of the judgment. I, we have boldness in the day of judgment. That's how our love is made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. See, so there's, a, there's two sides to this, to how the this, this foundation of, judge, of eternal judgment, it, uh, it, it, it has a, um, a compelling and a repelling work in, in, in your heart at the same time. It'll keep you from the world, but it also keeps you pressing forward at the same time. Jude said to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Yeah. Well, this is a... Just remember that this, this, is, this is foundational knowledge. This is not like graduate knowledge. This is not for post, just the postgraduates about judgment and resurrection. This is, for, this is teaching for everybody. This yeah. is foundation. If you don't have this foundation of the eternal judgment, you are seriously, seriously handicapped in your service to God and in your in the good fight of faith, in in going in going forward, in your in your resisting the devil, you're seriously handicapped in putting off the old man. Just imagine what type what type of strength do you have to put off the old man without the knowledge of the resurrection and the judgment? How successful will you be? How successful can you be at resisting the devil without the knowledge of repentance and faith? See, they're foundational. So let us not, let, let's go on to perfection, not laying again this foundation of these things. So lastly, in conclusion, if this foundation of judgment is not found in people, then those are the people that are free to say, who is Lord over us? Like David wrote about. Our tongue, well, with our tongues we had prevailed, and who who is Lord over us? Temptation, temptation gains uh, the advantage in people who have have not this this foundation. Foundation of, of particularly of resurrection and judgment. And so I I trust that uh, that the Lord is able to um, to bless you with these things. I've been blessed by thinking about the uh, the foundation, and it's good. You know, I'll just leave you this thought: it's it's good to be able to uh, to see where things fit into the kingdom, yeah. because yeah. the Lord is the Lord's building a structure, a structure of such grand um, uh, magnitude that He, like Brother Given said just recently, He's building a structure of such grand magnitude that He will be comfortable in it. That's right. Amen. And so this is a great house that has all manner of vessels, yeah. and it's good to see. To be able to decipher and discern what what manner of vessels there are, and to be able to tell the difference between a window and a door, and there see there are all all different details in this house that can be seen and observed, and like the the psalmists talk about marking all of her bulwarks and telling all of her towers, and it's good to be able to to look into the truth and to see where it fits in, how it fits in, and to see these things are foundational. 
And there, but there's, there's other things that are, that are that have different functions. They belong in different places. They're laid in different orders and at different times. And every one of us have in our, in our walk of faith, there are different times and seasons. Just like Solomon said about the, the things of this world, there's a time for everything and every, a season for everything. And as we, as we walk by faith and we're, uh, we come around different seasons again and again and again. There's a, a, we're in another summer and we're in another spring. And so it, it's just good to be, uh, it's good to grow up with the Lord. I guess that's what I'm, that's what I'm experiencing. So I, I hope these things have blessed you. Amen.